Tonight, uh, we have as our keynote Dr. Jeffrey Osler from the University of Oregon. And I have read several of his books, and in fact, I'm a big fan of the two that are about Native American culture. Uh, this last year, I read The Plains Sioux and U.S. Colonialism from Lewis and Clark to Wounded Knee and was just blown away by what an extraordinary book that is. I highly recommend it. Uh, more recently, he's published The Lakotas and the Black Hills. Um, but the book that, that brought him here, really, is his book about prairie discontentment. It's called Prairie Populism, The Fate of Agrarian Radicalism in Kansas, Nebraska, and Iowa, 1880 to 1892. And we want Dr. Osler to set the stage for all the conversation that will follow to place the prairie discontentments in the larger tradition dating all the way back to the Federalist Papers and James Madison, but more particularly and more recently in the progressive movement. Um, Jeffrey Osler teaches courses on Plains Indians. He's teaching a seminar this semester uh, based on Black Elk Speaks. Uh, he has been uh, extremely generous with us to come here. This is not his current research, but we convinced him that we needed him to help set the scene. He's the Beekman Professor of Northwest and Pacific History at the University of Oregon, where he's taught since 1990. He earned his PhD from the University of Iowa, and his dissertation was the basis for his book on prairie populism. So now, please join me in welcoming our keynote speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Osler. Thank you very much, Clay, for uh, that kind introduction and for inviting me here. Uh, can people hear me in the uh, back corner there? The back corner contingent says, okay, we're ready to go. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here uh, at the Theodore Roosevelt Center on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the Progressive, the Bull Moose Party, and the election of 1912, and of course, uh, like Clay looking at a newspaper editorial thinking about the election of 2012 in relationship to the election of 1912. As I thought about 1912, I couldn't help but think about our current election in some comparative sense. And uh, I won't say too much about that, uh, but just to say that when I do think about the two, it's hard for me not to become nostalgic about, about the old days, frankly. I like the election of 1912. Um, if I'd been in it, maybe I'd feel differently living through it. But I think there's a couple of things that are remarkable about it. Uh, one is that, yeah, there was some negative campaigning. Uh, and people who've written about it know it better than I do. Uh, at one time, for example, in the primary uh, contest between Roosevelt and President Taft, uh, Roosevelt called President Taft a fathead with the brains of a guinea pig. That w would have been a news cycle. Um, and there was more. But uh, when you look at the election, uh, especially as it came down uh, to the general election, uh, it offered, it's notable, I think, for offering a debate about substantive issues, especially about economic policy, issues that the country had faced for a long time. And the kinds of things that were on the table, I think, were serious, and the kinds of debates about them um, went to the core of important issues. Uh, and that was true, I think, not only in the well-known contest between Roosevelt's new nationalism and Woodrow, Woodrow Wilson's new freedom, but also in the ideas of Eugene Debs, uh, the Socialist Party candidate, uh, who reminds us of a time in American history when allegations of socialism could hit an actual target. Now, Roosevelt lost to Wilson, as you all know, uh, but he did receive what is usually regarded as the largest third party vote in American history, uh, taking 27% of the popular vote and winning 88 electoral votes in six states. 
At one level, what Roosevelt's Bull Moose Party accomplished was, was impressive. Uh, this is the best a third party did. However, the fact that it was the very best a third party has ever done, and that it did so under very unusual circumstances, underscores how difficult it has been for third parties to succeed in American history. Even a fairly popular, charismatic ex-president, and one who had substantial support from portions of uh, the Republican Party leadership, uh, not all of it by any means, but substantial resources. Um, even under those circumstances, the best a third party could do was under a third of the vote. And even this may overstate the high watermark of third parties, since in some ways the Bull Moose Party was not really a third party at all. Rather, it might be best described as a breakaway faction from one of the two major parties. Seen this way, the true third party in the election of 1912, we might think of it as being Debs' Socialist Party, and it received only 6% of the vote, uh, which is a level of support that is more typical, I would say, of third parties in American history. So why have third parties fa fared so poorly in American history? What I'd like to do in the next 30 or 35 minutes is to explore this question with you by looking at what I believe was the most promising grassroots third party in American history, the Populist Party. The Populist Party had its beginnings uh, in the late 1880s, so sort of on the Theodore Roosevelt calendar, uh, about the time he left. Uh, his Dakota ranch to return to New York City. The Populist Party began not as a political party, uh, but as a grassroots social movement among distressed farmers in the South, the Midwest, the Plains, and the Far West. This was a period of hard time for farmers. Since the end of the Civil War, farmers had faced uh, several decades of economic distress. And the main problem for them was that simply the prices for what they produced, corn, wheat, cotton in the South, livestock, generally declined. And that was particularly a problem in terms of debts that farmers owed. So many of you will instantly perceive this, uh, but I often, in talking to my own students, put this in terms of contemporary things that I think they might recognize, which is massive credit card debt or student loan debt. So you think of somebody with credit card debt today of, say, $10,000, who has a job, but the, the salary of that job was to decline by 10% each year, it's going to become increasingly harder to pay back that credit card debt. And the same thing is true for farmers uh, in this period of declining prices for their products. They felt themselves, they expressed it this way, that they were trapped in a vice. So in the late 1880s, farmers began organizing farmers' alliances. Their idea was not to create a new political party, but rather to educate themselves uh, to try to understand the reasons why, despite backbreaking work, and here I'm thinking about the entire farm family, women, men, children, despite backbreaking work, year after year, they were nonetheless face to face with destitution. They were certainly in many cases not getting ahead. And as they began to develop, a diagnosis, an understanding of their economic problems, the Farmers Alliance then began to formulate proposals for reform. Regulation of railroads, a graduated or progressive income tax, and reform of the nation's financial system so that it would um, advance the interests of farmers over the narrow interests uh, of bankers and creditors. So the farmers then went to the third part, to the existing two-party system. They didn't form a new party. They went to the two parties and they said, you're the politicians. We elect you. You're working for us. We're the people. Do these things that are going to solve our problems. 
The Farmers' Alliance was one of the largest mass movements in American history. At its height, it had perhaps 2 million members, including 400,000, about 20 percent uh, women who were members, in more than two dozen states. And there was also a separate colored alliance, as it was called, uh, with several hundred thousand black farmers, mostly impoverished sharecroppers in the South. So the Farmers Alliance then had the power of serious numbers across a considerable geography. And it had the power of a desperate, yet optimistic political passion. And it was a passion that was grounded in two beliefs. The first, was that farmers were the backbone of the American economy. We can see this in a number of ways. One way we can see it is in a popular song that Farmers Alliances sang. So they would get together at, say, a local schoolhouse. They would talk about their problems. They would try to do economic analysis, but they would also socialize and they also sang. So one of their most popular songs was just simply called The Farmer Feeds Them All. Uh, and I will not sing it. But I will read you a couple of verses. The king may rule or land and sea. The Lord may live right royally. The soldier rides in pomp and pride, but the farmer feeds them all. The verse, or the chorus goes, you know, the farmer feeds them all, farmer feeds them all. Another verse. The writer thinks, the poet sings, the craftsman fashions wondrous things, the doctor heals, the lawyer pleads, but the farmer feeds them all, and it goes on with other occupations. The second belief was that farmers, as the largest single group in largest occupation in the United States, were the people, and that a truly democratic political system would promote the interests of the people uh, and not the interests of minority groups, bankers, monopolists, and plutocrats. And we can see this idea sort of expressed negatively in uh, the cartoon uh, uh, that I have up here. Uh, it's not technically produced by a populist, but it's produced in 1889 and reflects this view. And its caption is the bosses of the Senate. And who is it that are the bosses of the Senate? It's the plutocrats in the back, the bloated ones. And they're all labeled with a different trust, Iron Trust, Sugar Trust, and so on. And you can see in the back, you can see the people's entrance right there, closed, closed. And the senators are, you know, not an admirable lot uh, in the foreground. Now, the farmers wanted to reverse this then, to open, as it were, the people's entrance. And this idea was also at the heart of processions that Farmers Alliances staged. It was common uh, on July 4th uh, for farmers within a given county to meet at a pre-appointed place and form a parade, a procession, into, say, the county seat. Uh, and they would do this to demonstrate to themselves, but also to the townspeople, their numerical strength. Here come the people, and we are going to claim what is rightfully ours in a democratic society. And um, when they came into town, this is a photograph of a small parade uh, in a Kansas county, and you can see that they have the flag and they have a banner. Uh, and we know from newspaper accounts what some of these banners said. So they would read things like, two bushels of corn for one pound of coffee, right? And they would read things like, money trusts, fat capitalists, and lean farmers, right? Uh, so here then is the situation in the late 1880s. Farmers Alliances had organized in 20 to 25 states. They were nonpartisan again. They didn't say, let's form a third party. They're asking politicians of both parties to listen to the voice of the people. Now, in some states, and they were doing this really at the state level, in some states, Farmers Alliances succeeded in getting the two-party system to respond to their demands. And a case in point is Iowa, where the Farmers Alliance in that state convinced the legislature in the late 1880s to pass a law to regulate railroads. 
And it was a modest reform, but it was a real one. And it was a significant victory. The people really could claim back their institutions, was the lesson. In other states, though, the existing parties rebuffed the farmers' alliances. And when this happened, farmers began to say, if the two parties won't listen to us, if they just ignore us, maybe we're going to have to take matters into our own hands and form a political party of our own. And this is precisely what happened in 1890, which was an off-year election. So, you know, governors are at stake, state legislators, congr congressional campaigns, and so on um, in the off-year election. In Kansas, Nebraska, and the two Dakotas, uh, that's what happened. The Farmers Alliance decided it would have to form a new political party, a people's party. And that then formed the basis to the organization of a national people's party in 1892, uh, which was, of course, presidential election year. And the people's party, the populist party, nominated uh, for president uh, a man named James Weaver from Iowa. And their platform was quite far-reaching. They called for political reform, direct primary elections, direct elections of senators, and they called for economic reforms. Government ownership of railroads, not just regulation, but actual ownership of railroads, uh, a graduated income tax, and a plan for the federal government to loan money directly to farmers, and how would it loan the money to farmers? It would actually print paper money to do that, to put more money into circulation, lowering interest rates for farmers, but also um, they thought, they hoped, reversing this general tendency to falling prices as more money was put into circulation. Populists, as far as I can tell, like many third parties, were quite optimistic. I think they actually thought they had a chance of winning. And they conducted a grassroots political campaign with great enthusiasm. Stump speakers, the most famous of the populist stump speakers, is a woman named, Amer uh, excuse me, named Mary Elizabeth Lease, uh, who reportedly urged farmers to raise less corn and more hell. Uh, and here's a photograph of Lise from the time. She had come out of many circles, prohibition, women's suffrage, and so on, but she was, by all accounts, a very charismatic uh, orator. Now, the major parties excoriated the populists as hayseeds and as demagogues, but populists took these allegations as badges of pride. At one time, uh, in the campaign, one of the campaigns, a Kansas Republican uh, joked that one of the Kansas populists named Jerry Simpson was such a rube that he didn't wear any socks. And so instead of saying, oh no, no, our guy really does wear socks. Look, you know, Ms. Simpson, would you stand up and show the Republicans that I do wear socks? They took uh, the slur and took it as a badge of pride and bestowed on Simpson uh, the nickname Sockless Jerry and celebrated him. In the election, populists received 8.5% of the popular vote nationally. They carried 22 electoral votes, uh, including one of the three in North Dakota. Uh, here is a map uh, of the uh, popular vote for Weaver in 1892, and you can see it shaded heavily in the states where he did well. Well, it was a, a disappointing showing for the populists. Um, they had some support in the South, as you can see. Uh, they had quite a bit of support in the Plains and in some of the Rocky Mountain states, since again a little bit, it fell off, but significant support in the far west. But what I think is really critical is that in the big states of the Midwest, they didn't do very well. Minnesota, Little, Wisconsin, 
Michigan, Indiana, Illinois, Missouri, not much. And in Iowa, Weaver's home state, the voters there gave the native son 5% is all. And that's what I think is really critical, is that there's a lot of farmers in those states and not many of them vote for this third party. Now, despite this disappointing showing, populists tried their best to remain optimistic. But in the end, they were unable to develop much momentum after 1892. And by 1896, the populists were deeply divided internally. Some decided to continue pursuing a third party strategy. Others decided, though, that their only hope was to back the Democratic Party candidate for president, William Jennings Bryan. Uh, who is sometimes regarded as a populist, uh, but in my view at least represents uh, a somewhat watered down view or version of populism. Bryan's main proposal, uh, of course, in the election of 1896 for dealing with the depressed economy was free coinage of silver, uh, which I think was far less robust than what the populists had originally proposed, which was having the government print paper money and loan it to farmers. When Bryan lost to McKinley in 1896, I think populism had continued some, but it was pretty much over uh, in at least that iteration. Now, why then did the populists not do any better? Uh, and here I want to look at the election of 1892 particularly. Uh, if they were ever going to do well, they were going to have to do better than that when they first started. Otherwise, they weren't going to keep up momentum. Why? Well, most historians have said that the reason for that pattern up there is economic conditions were different. That things were worse where Weaver did well than they were where he didn't do very well at all. Uh, and there's some reasons to think that. Um, out on the plains, as, as those of you who have looked at all at the history of this area, and I know almost all of you have, will know that the place gets droughts, right? And there was one in effect, one in effect uh, starting in 1887, right when the Farmers Alliance was organizing. And what had happened, of course, is that before that it had been a period of above average rainfall, and that led to a settlement boom out in this area and down in South Dakota too, as you know, before, you know, in, in Dakota Territory days. And that was fueled by above average rainfall and people started developing this idea, ha, rain follows the plow, if you just turn the soil over, moisture will be released and the climate will permanently change. Well, 1887 came along and it was a significant drought. And I know that in Kansas, for example, there's reports of farmers leaving western Kansas with uh, words on their wagons written, in God we trusted, in Kansas we busted. They decided to go back east. Now, a lot of people stayed, of course. Now, for those who did stay and then organized farmers' alliances, historians have said, well, out in those areas, uh, farmers were suffering from l much lower prices, uh, higher railroad rates, higher rates of indebtedness, and all the rest. Now, there's some truth in that. Things really were worse on the plains. But I would argue not by all that much, actually. I would say that farmers throughout the Midwest, throughout the country, really, were facing hard times. There was drought in the Midwest, too. It wasn't as bad, but if you look at the records, there was drought. And all farmers, and this I think is really the most important thing, were, deflate, were facing this general problem of declining prices. Um, in Iowa, prices for corn were so low that farmers were burning it for fuel instead of buying coal. They said it just it makes more sense for us to save money by not buying coal and just burn this stuff. Uh, that was in 1889-1890. And uh, moreover, farmers' alliances had emerged in all of these states that never became populist. Iowa, Illinois, Indiana, to a lesser degree in Wisconsin, but it's also in Minnesota. And farmers in those states who organized farmers' alliances weren't doing it just, you know, to sing happy songs. They were doing it because they were distressed. 
and they wanted to seek some kind of relief from their problems. So if not economic conditions, what else might explain this pattern? And the answer, I think, is politics rather than economics. And what really mattered, I think, is that in the populous states where Weaver did well, those were the states where the two-party system had rebuffed the Farmers Alliance's Alliance earlier. The Alliance had gone to the two-party politicians in those states and said, do things for us, here's what we want. And they had said, go away. They then were radicalized politically. In the other states, uh, and I gave you the example of railroad reform in Iowa, there's other examples in the other states, the party system had responded when farmers made demands with modest reforms, but with some real reforms. And that meant that farmers in those places were not willing to break with their party loyalties. And that leads us to consider the problem of party loyalties during this period. Because I would say, and it's a challenge for third parties all the time, but I would say that at this period in American history, it is even more a challenge for a third party to get voters to not just vote for you, not just want what you want, but to break with the other guy that you've been voting for for 20 years. The Republicans or the Democrats. And this, I think, is an era where party loyalties are stronger probably than at any other time in American history, uh, the late 19th century. And a good part of the reason has to do with the Civil War. The Civil War was over by 25 years, but there were still a lot of people on both sides who had fought in it. And for younger voters, their fathers had fought in it, their uncles had fought in it, and so on. Now because of this, in the North, most farmers were loyal Republicans. And what that meant is that when the Populist Party came onto the scene, Republicans were able to counter it by what was called waving the bloody shirt, calling on farmers to vote as they had shot or as their fathers had shot, telling them that since the Populists had little chance of winning, a vote for the populace was really a vote for the Democrats. That's what would happen. The Democrats would win if you vote populist. And the Democrats, after all, were traitors who had betrayed the Union at the cost of the blood of tens of thousands of the Union's young men. In the South, the logic was the same, though in reverse. There, most white farmers were loyal Democrats. Their daddies, too, had fought in the war, but of course for the Confederacy. For a time after the Civil War, Republicans, as you know, uh, supported by former slaves, by freed people, had gained significant power uh, during the period of Reconstruction. Uh, but during the 1870s, it happened fairly quickly in most places and was a process accompanied uh, by massive political violence. Uh, Democrats regained political power and restored white supremacy. And so when the Populist Party came onto the scene, Democrats countered to it by appealing, countered it by appealing to racism, telling farmers that since populists had little chance of winning, a vote for the populists was really a vote for the Republicans. And if Republicans got back in, all the horrors of Reconstruction would return. Racially inferior African Americans would regain political and social power, they said, in various ways. That would lead to political corruption and high taxes. Far worse, Democrats warned, a Republican victory would once again embolden black men to rape white women. It was difficult for a third party, it was difficult for populists to overcome these party loyalties. It's always been an issue, especially so at this period. Populists were able to counter them in some places, but only in places where the two parties had almost gone out of their way to offend them, uh, to say, no, you don't count. 
Then they were radicalized. Then they said, I don't believe in the Republicans anymore, and so on. But in other places where there had been some concessions made by the party system, it was hard for populists to pry people away from their affiliations. So I would say then that millions of farmers throughout the country were open to the ideas of the populists and their proposals for reform, but most could not bring themselves to vote for them. Now, I want to turn to a kind of larger question out of this, uh, which is what this story about the populists tells us about the problems of third parties in general in American history. And I want to suggest a couple of points. One is that, uh, here I'm drawing on what political scientists have pointed out about rules governing elections and electoral systems, political systems, that they matter a great deal. And in the US, as you know, we have a winner-take-all system, uh, which means that a third party gets nothing uh, out of 8 or 10 or 15 or 18 percent of the vote. Uh, very little anyway, and so it's very difficult because there's no immediate rewards. It's very difficult for a third party to get a footing and sustain momentum. By contrast, there's other kinds of systems around the world, some of you may know some of them well, of proportional representation where parties are awarded seats in legislative assemblies according to what they get in a general election. Um, so that if you get 10% of the vote, you're going to get 10% of the seats in a legislative assembly and systems like that tend to promote uh, multi-party systems, not just three parties, but more in some cases. And they can have their own problems, but from this standpoint of the viability of third parties, those kinds of systems tend to promote multi-partyism. So the U.S. just doesn't have that. For better or worse, that's the situation. Another factor I think that's important is the sheer size of the United States and its decentralized um, political structure, a structure of federalism where states have significant power. And this is the factor that James Madison emphasized uh, back in the 1780s uh, when he was arguing uh, for the adoption of the Constitution in Federalist Number 10. And he argued that you should, you should adopt the Constitution so that you can have a large republic. And he said a large republic would be a good thing. Madison's great worry was what he called factionalism. Uh, and the kind of faction that he warned against, uh, he was actually quite explicit about this, was very similar to what the populists were. A faction of debtors, uh, which from the standpoint of commercial and creditor interests threatened to redistribute wealth by calling for issue of paper money and release of debts in that way. And Madison abhorred that kind of thing. Um, he saw it as an illegitimate faction. And he set about, how can, we, how can we deal with this problem of factions in a constitution? And he said, can they be eliminated? And he went through and concluded, no, you can't actually get rid of them, but what you can do is create a structure that will contain them. And he wrote in uh, Federalist Number 10, he wrote, under a large republic, the influence, here I'm quoting from, the influence of factious leaders may kindle a flame within their particular states, but will be unable to spread a general conflagration throughout the other states. And that, I think, is really very prophetic of what we see here in 1892. We see what Madison's terms a um, small fire starting out on the plains, um, but it's unable to become a general conflagration uh, because of a large decentralized republic. Now, does this mean that third parties don't matter? Have I given you an address about the irrelevance of something? Well, no, 
Third parties certainly matter. Uh, we know that in many national elections, especially close national elections, third parties have had a, an impact on the outcome. Uh, this was most certainly the case fairly recently in 2000 when Ralph Nader's Green Party won about 3% of the popular vote, but almost certainly took enough votes away from Al Gore in the critical state of Florida to deny him an uncontested victory there. Third parties matter then, clearly, uh, but the, do they actually ever do any good? Now some scholars have argued that as a sort of general principle um, in American history, third parties are often ahead of their time and promote ideas that people aren't quite ready for, but that eventually people get ready for them, public opinion advances, and the two-party system adopts their ideas eventually. And a number of historians have applied this perspective to the populist party. And they've argued that the nation wasn't quite ready for the populist proposals for reform in the 1890s, but that 20 years later, the progressives took them up. And since public opinion by that time had advanced, progressives were able to enact the populist proposals for reform. And so in this way of thinking, progressives were essentially latter-day populists. Now, uh, that's a happy story. Uh, if, if you like populists at all, I guess it's a rather unhappy story if you don't. But it's certainly a story of a nice move uh, from one point to another. Um, it's a little too happy and uncomplicated though, I think. Uh, the relationship between populism and the reforms of the progressive era is more complicated than that. And I hope that in the next uh, few days, uh, we'll get a chance, I'm sure we will, to explore uh, some of the many interconnections and complicated relationships between populism as a grassroots movement of farmers, the nonpartisan league, a movement in my view quite similar, although pursuing a somewhat different political strategy, uh, and various strands of the progressive movement, and there were many of them. For now, though, uh, what I'd like to do is just simply note a couple of differences between the populace of 1892 and Theodore Roosevelt in the progressive era and 1912. Now, when we think about Roosevelt in connection with populism, um, he did support uh, some of the economic reforms that the populists had advocated. And one uh, was a progressive income tax. Uh, but he opposed government ownership of railroads. He advocated regulation of railroads. Uh, but his approach to regulation of railroads um, was a more moderate approach to, say, somebody uh, like Robert La Follette. Um, who advocated a more aggressive approach to re uh, regulation of railroads. Even more than that, I would say, Roosevelt's general orientation and ideas about railroads and other large corporations uh, were very different from the populists. In Roosevelt's first term as president, he aggressively pursued antitrust action against a holding company of railroads uh, called the Northern Securities Company. And um, of course, he frequently denounced uh, in what I always think of a wonderful phrase, the malefactors of great wealth. But he accepted the reality, uh, and I would say indeed the desirability uh, of large corporations in a modern economy. Populists did not. And what he wanted to do was not break up large uh, corporations permanently or something, um, but to use the powers of the federal government uh, to make corporations behave responsibly. 
And I think that Richard Hofstadter put his finger on this particular aspect of Roosevelt's orientation in his book, The American Political Tradition, when he wrote that Roosevelt's goal was, quote, to save the masters of capital from their own stupid obstinacy. So I wouldn't say that progressivism then was the fulfillment of populism, uh, but I would say uh, that the populists deserve credit for putting on the table three important reforms that the progressives deserve credit for adopting. And those I would identify, two of them political, the direct election of senators and direct primary elections, and one economic, which is the progressive income tax, uh, which was made part of the U.S. Constitution uh, by the 16th Amendment, which was ratified uh, in 1913. But I would also say that even more than these specific reforms, populists also deserve credit, and along with others, certainly at their time in the late 19th century, for calling attention in a compelling way to economic injustice and its adverse consequences for democracy that cartoon, the bosses of the Senate. Issues then that the nation began to debate then and continue to debate in a substantive way in the progressive era, particularly during the election of 1912. And so in this way, it seems to me, the populists played an important role in facilitating the transition from the excesses and evasions of the Gilded Age to the more responsible politics of the progressive era. Thank you.